good morning everybody. My name's Gareth and we're going to go over a quick overview of the new features coming out in 2016. Um, there's some really cool, interesting enhancements that they're bringing out in 2016. There's some upgrades to some features that they brought out previously and there's some, you know, normal stuff that they're just uh, enhancing the existing features that they've had in SQL for a while and uh, it's going to be a really, really awesome release. I'm really excited for it. There's been a lot of hype around it. There's some uh, amazing stuff that we can actually do with 2016 now, specifically as a DBA. Now, I'm a DBA um, and I really enjoy doing things like performance tuning, and database assessments, um, migrations and consolidations and that sort of thing. So the new features that are coming in 2016 are really exciting to me. There's also some really cool um, exciting features in the BI space and there are uh, a lot of other speakers this month that are going to be covering that because um, I'm not as experienced as those guys so I'm not going to even try. So we're going to go over um, general enhancements, we'll talk about some DBA stuff, um, all the stuff that's really exciting to me about what's coming out in SQL 2016. Now, who am I? My name's Gareth. I'm, I work for Pragmatic Works. I've been here uh, for five years already. Time goes fast. Well, and uh, I'm originally from South Africa, so yes, you are listening with an accent. Um, I finished university in 93 and started doing systems administration. I worked for a third-party maintenance company in South Africa that did support on all sorts of things, Linux machines, Novell Netware, Silicon Graphics machines, Windows machines, even control data mainframes. And then I moved over to America in 2001 and um, did systems administration here. Um, I did a lot of Windows systems administration and about 10 Years ago or so, I started at a company down in South Florida and the DBA that was there at the time left. So I went to the boss and I said, I want to take over the SQL and I went on a few training classes and I jumped in feet first and became a DBA. So I've been working with SQL for over 10 years now um, and I've taken that SQL ex experience, added it to my systems administration experience and I do a lot of good um, hardware and systems uh, SQL kind of work. Like I said, performance tuning, database assessments, migrations. I also work on big data warehouses, the um, parallel data warehouse and the APS appliance, fast track data warehouses, and do ETL, that sort of thing. Um, I contributed three chapters to the Professional SQL 2012 Administration Book, and I speak at user groups and SQL Saturdays. I've presented at the SQL Pass Summit before, and I do webinars like this. I'm also involved in the Pass organization as a regional mentor for the Southeast region. There's my contact details, and there's my two wonderful little treasures. So this is some of the new features in SQL 2016. There's a lot of interesting stuff that Microsoft has worked on over the last um, two years, trying to introduce upgrades and new features into SQL 2016. They have um, a focus right now on the Azure kind of line of business, but the work that they're doing on the Azure SQL databases and SQL um, environment in Azure translates to brand new features and upgraded features in the Box product. So today I'm going to kind of mostly talk about the Box product and the new stuff that's coming out, well has come out yesterday in SQL 2016, but um, there is some stuff that they have added in Azure as well that um, and later in the month somebody's going to be talking about that. The General enhancements include things like the advanced analytics integration with R. And R is very um, useful in doing predictive analysis and predictive modeling. The uh, advanced analytics guys are really excited about that. Uh, Jason Shu is going to be talking about that later this month. And it's 
to see that that is directly included into SQL right now. If you take a stored procedure, you can directly code your R code right into a stored procedure and SQL will be able to translate that and execute that R code right in line. It's really cool stuff. If you're interested in that sort of thing, definitely check out our um, webinars on that. Some really cool DBA features that I'm excited about, transactional replication is now available from SQL to Azure SQL Database. So you can use Azure SQL Database as a um, off-site DR for your SQL Server just using transactional replication like you do from SQL Server to SQL Server nowadays. Another really interesting, and I can't wait to use this at a customer, is per session wait statistics. Currently, we can only get per instance wait statistics for a SQL Server instance, the um, DM exec session wait stats, new DMV has been introduced so that you can get per session wait statistics. This is going to be huge for performance tuning in, um, in customers for me definitely and for every DBA. I, if you are a DBA, this is definitely one of the features that you're going to be excited about. <coughs> Excuse me. Instant file initialization is one of those configurations that I repeatedly go to customers and find that they haven't set it up correctly because it's not intuitive, it's not something that you um, think about except when your database is really slow doing things like order growth or restores or stuff like that. So instant file initialization configuration is now included during initial setup and you can go and um, insert the SQL Server service account that you're going to use for SQL Server and it will go and do that configuration for you during the setup. Really, really cool stuff. There is enhanced backup um, capabilities to Azure so you can get encrypted backups and uh, enhanced restore capabilities to and from Azure. Uh, they've included that in the Box product. Do I see some questions? Somebody is ra raising their hands. Wasn't transactional replication backboarded to SQL 2012? Um, to the box product, yes, but not to SQL Server um, in Azure. So I believe that the new in SQL 2016 is transactional replication to to Azure. Okay. <clears throat> In-memory OLTP came out brand new in SQL Server 2014. There was a lot of really interesting things that you could do with it, but it was a pretty niche product. So um, there was a lot of limitations on in-memory OLTP in SQL 2014. It was unbelievably quick for the specific use cases that you could use it for, um, there were some a, a lot of restrictions on it. In SQL 2016, a lot of these restrictions have been removed. Uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft has done a lot of work to improve the product immensely, and now you can use in-memory LTP together with a lot more um, features and things inside your database, things like foreign keys, um, unique and check constraints, out of joins, union alls, distincts, exists, all of these things are now supported with in-memory OLTP tables, so there's a lot more um, use, or you can use in-memory OLTP tables in more cases. Um, it is still very much a niche product, so you need to evaluate exactly what the use case is for you to go and use in memory LTP. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a trade-off with the speed where you get a little less uh, durability and that sort of thing available with this feature. But if you are in a position where you are looking seriously at using in memory LTP, you should definitely upgrade to SQL 2016 because you're going to get a lot, a lot more use out of in-memory LTP at that point. Do we have some more questions? Any size enhancement with SSIS? I cannot 
um, speak to any of the analysis services enhancements because I don't know about any of them, but we can table that question and I'll send it off to one of my colleagues that does work with analysis services and find out exactly what the um, answer is there for you. Okay, thanks Vinny. Always encrypted. Always encrypted is a feature that allows clients and customers to encrypt the sensitive data inside the applications and never reveal and never allow the database engine access to those keys, to those encryption keys. As a result, always encrypted is there so that you have a separation between the users that own the data and are able to see the data and the users that uh, manage the data but should not be able to see the data. So the way that it works is that there is a uh, always encrypted driver on the client machine that is able to, or on the trusted machine shall we say, that is able to decrypt the data so that the user that has that you know, always encrypted uh, decryption key is able to actually see the data, but high uh, privileged, like database administrators, users are not able to see the data at all. The data is always encrypted to those users. So even if they query that database, they're just going to see the encrypted data. It protects the data at rest and in motion because the encryption key resides at the application side. So <clears throat> always encrypted enables all of our customers to store extremely sensitive data outside of their direct control. It allows um, organizations to encrypt the data at rest and in storage like in Azure to um, allow non-on-premises ad administrative users management capabilities of that data to reduce um, requirements for things like security clearance and um, that sort of thing of the data. The, th the problem with this, <laughs> the little problem with this, is that the encryption key resides at the application level, which typically at the moment means that the encryption key resides on the client machine on the user machine and one of the most hacked machines in your entire is of course your client machine. So what you want to do, this is the recommendation, is have a middleware server which is the application server and that is where you install your encryption key, your always encrypted driver. That is the layer that then does the decryption and your user client basically connects to that application server and doesn't have the encryption key on the client machine. So please remember that when you are considering installing or configuring always encrypted that you've got to make sure that you secure the machine where the encrypted encryption key is because otherwise you're basically just handing off the keys if somebody gets into that client machine. There are some um, restrictions for this feature, things like full text search, replication, change data capture, in-memory LTP, that sort of thing. Remember that as with most new features in SQL Server, this is a V1 feature and it is going to get better. They are working at it. They are going to make always encrypted available to use with a lot more features going forward, but currently these are the restrictions on the always encrypted. And please remember, always encrypted, when we're talking about that, this is at the column level rather than at the database level. There are other security features that operate at the database level, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Query store. This is one of the big, uh, fancy, new, really awesome features that is available in 2016, and I'm really, really excited about this. Query store maintains multiple execution clients per query. It's basically the black box inside your SQL Server that keeps a record of all the um, execution plans and the execution times and the statistics and everything that goes along with the execution of a query. And it keeps all of that data over time. 
there's actually two stores that it uh, stores the information in, a plan store and a runtime statistics store. The plan store keeps the execution plan information, the execution plan itself, and the metrics that went along with that uh, execution plan, and the runtime statistics store persists the statistics information of the data at the time that that query was executed. The way that it works is that when you execute a query, the SQL goes and compiles that query, goes and optimizes that query, and then copies the data out into the plan store. And then it goes and executes that query, and it uses those statistics and metrics for the execution of that query, and that copies the runtime statistics out into the runtime statistics store. Those two stores together form the query store that you are able to query. So after you've run the query a couple times, maybe it's a stored procedure that runs every night or um, multiple times a day, you can then go back and you can go and uh, investigate exactly what the performance of that query was, of that stored procedure. You can easily find plan regression. You can pinpoint most expensive queries. You can go and analyze, analyze the workload of all these queries that are executing on your machine. It's really, really interesting stuff. If you go and look at the new query store heading underneath your database, then the query store is stored per database because um, you have to turn it on at the database level. You can go and see that there are uh, headings underneath the query store for regressed queries, overall resource consumption, top resource consuming queries, and track queries. When you go into the re regressed queries, you can go and investigate exactly the duration, the CPU time, the logical reads, all of these metrics about that query. You can have a look at the execution plan for that query at a specific point in time. You can go and see exactly how the execution plan changes over time. So you go and look at it um, for a specific date, um, look at it for a specific execution and you can go and investigate the execution plan for that, and you can get the full breakdown of statistics, of memory consumption, of logical reads, all of these things for a specific query over time. It's just absolutely awesome. They've built this now in to SQL Server. This, I promise you, is one of those big um, silver bullet kind of things that you go, I definitely want to upgrade to 2016 because that's DBA. This is definitely going to make my life a million times easier because there's nothing worse than sitting there and somebody comes to you and says, hey, I had a problem with a query last night at 12 o'clock. Can you tell me what happened? And you're going, well, I don't have anything monitoring that. I don't have anything capturing the data about queries that run during the night. So no, I have no idea what happened with that query. So, sorry. And this is now built in to SQL, so you don't even have to buy any third-party monitoring software to be able to do that. This is built right in. Other third-party monitoring software is good to have in addition to this, but if you don't have anything or you don't have the budget to buy anything, this is now built into SQL 2016. You can use it directly in there. You can also go and look at top resource consumers. So you go and look at the times and executions of the query. You can go and look at um, CPU time, logical reads, logical writes, prison memory consumption for each uh, query. And you can actually go and compare plans between two executions of a query to go and see exactly what changed, exactly what is the difference between those two execution plans. Are the statistics different? And you can actually go and force a specific execution plan to be used next time that query is run. And that is even, that is most, most interesting and amazing that you can actually go and do that. Included with this query store is what's known as live query statistics. And this is a new thing that is going to really revolutionize my performance tuning when I go to a customer, where you can go and not only include actual execution plan, you can go and click and add, include live query statistics. And what that looks like is something like this. 
where you're executing the query, it shows you exactly what operator is currently executing, what operator is about to be executing, the statistics for each of these operators. Um, it's really, really amazing stuff that's going to be available with uh, Query Store. Do we have any questions around Query Store? You know, <laughs> there is a very, very common question that I get every time I do this uh, presentation. I've done this now since the beginning of the year. Is this available in Standard Edition? And I'm very glad to say that it is. Microsoft has come out and they have said that this is now available in every single edition of SQL Server. So it's available right for you in Standard Edition. Um, how much space does it take to store this data? Uh, you can configure it, I believe, to retain, retain a certain number of, of days of information. And it does take up some disk space, but it takes up uh, data in your plan, in your execution plan store. Um, I don't believe it's going to be a performance impact because it's built in to SQL Server and the information, the statistics that it's collecting, it's just copying the data over when it does the query optimization. Um, I believe so. Even in Express, even in Express Edition, it is available in uh, Express Edition. Very limited, obviously, but it is available in Express Edition because, like I say, the performance is going to be uh, very minimal. The performance hit, the performance um, impact is going to be minimal because the information, this, the execution plans are copied into the plan store at um, optimization and it is turned on permanently it's it's included with SQL Server you can't turn it off really yeah well you can but you don't want to but yes you can turn it on permanently the performance impact is really going to be very 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 light another really really good question is it restored with the database being restored yes it's included with the plan plans in the database when you back up a database. So when you restore a database from, say, production to a development server or to a test server or to a QA server, you actually get that um, history along, along with it. All right. So this query store and uh, live query statistics and live query plans, this is an absolutely awesome thing. I can't say how amazing it is and I can't wait to actually go and use the stuff in uh, a custom environment. If you do need to have, uh, need some more information about this, um, I do believe there is a webinar coming up during our month on the query store. Um, if not, we will put together a webinar and definitely do that. There are multiple webinars I know that are um, being offered outside of Pragmatic Works on query stores. There's uh, webinars or presentations being offered at SQL Saturdays and virtual chapters I'm sure are going to be having uh, sessions on this. Uh, if you have any more questions, please send me email and we'll definitely do our best to give you as much information as we can. I'm going to carry on playing with this. I've kind of played with a little bit with RC2 and 3, but uh, we downloaded the new um, developer edition that was released yesterday and I'll be playing with that this weekend in between sitting on the beach of course. <laughs> um, included with this is um, a link to the live execution plan and live query plan in your activity monitor so you can get to it through there. All right, we can move on to row level security. Role-level security is a really cool new feature where you can actually go and configure role-level access control based on a user's membership of a specific group. This is restriction logic that is now located at the database level as opposed to always encrypted which was located at the um, application level. What happens is you go and create a filter 
predicate and a block predicate. And the filter predicate silently filters the rows that are available to things like selects, updates, deletes, insta, that sort of thing. And a block predicate explicitly blocks write operations that violate that predicate on the database. So you have to create this predicate function that says I want to filter these rows based on these um, criteria and then you create the security policy that binds that function to the table and to the user. So when the user goes and queries the database, the user only receives that the rows that that user is allowed to see. So if you go and specify a predicate function that says that users of this specific group are not allowed to see rows that have a certain um, date or a certain um, product ID or something like that, the users that query the database, they're only going to receive the rows that they are allowed to see, that that function allows them to see. So it could even be um, a performance increase because the database is only going to go and query and um, the storage engine is only going to return those rows that that user is allowed to see. So if the user is not allowed to see very many rows, it's going to return very few rows. If the user um, has the security to be able to see all the data in the database, then they're going to be returning all of those rows from the query when that query is executed. Stretch database, unless there's any questions on row level security. Um, yes, there's a couple of questions on row level security. Does row level security affect aggregates, like for example the totals column? Yes, definitely. You're only going to get the aggregate of those rows that are returned. So aggregate is obviously calculated on the rows that um, the, day the user actually receives in the result set, so the aggregates are only going to be calculated on that set of uh, rows. Are row-level security rules written in SQL-based syntax? Yes, um, and I'm sorry I don't have an example of that, but um, I do know that one of the other webinars later this month is on security and on this kind of uh, feature, so we'll be able to have demos available for that, so look out for that. Will we get a copy of the slides? Yes, we. I have copies of the slides. Um, I'll make sure that I get them to Pragmatic Works and we are able to distribute them or um, have them for download on the, on the site with, together with the recording. And that'll be in the next couple of days, right, Liz, I believe? Correct. Okay, excellent. Is there a performance boost of row-level security versus doing this at the application level? Yes, it could be because, like I say, when the user queries a database that has row-level security enabled, he's only going to receive those rows that he's allowed to see, so that the I.O. is actually improved. Um, will this work with always-on availability groups? Yes, because this is configured at the database level. So the database will be um, replicated and the configuration will be replicated along with the always-on availability group. I'm trying to see if there's any other questions higher up that I have not got to. Um, I think we'll keep these questions, uh, I think I've got most of them, we'll keep whatever questions that I didn't hit up to this point uh, for, oh, there's, it, does row level security affect the index? Um, yes, because it's at the base table level, so where the index gets that same filter and predicate applied to it. Okay, let's move on to Stretch Databases. Stretch Databases is a new feature available that allows us to use Azure and to use storage in Azure 
to store archive data. What happens is you create a table or you table and you configure stretch database on that table, on that database. Then SQL in the background will go and decide what which data is archive data, has not been accessed recently, all of that sort of thing, and it will silently, transparently copy that data up to a Azure SQL database that you specify when you configure your remote data archive. The data then is stored in Azure. The query that you execute against that data then goes and runs the query across the on-premises database and the Azure SQL database to return that data to you. The user code, when you run your query, you still point to the SQL on-premises instance. You don't go and then run your query against the Azure SQL database that you've configured. You point to the local on-premises instant instance and the SQL itself will go and fetch the query, the data via the query in Azure itself. So it looks a little bit like this. We have eligible data for moving to the remote site, to the remote endpoint, and we have local data. So local data is stored on the on-premises SQL and the eligible data for archiving is moved or copied over to Azure SQL database to the instance that you uh, specify when you set it up. And that holds a remote copy of that data so that you can then um, take data that is now filling up your database. Maybe you have a data warehouse and you've got data that's saved for the last seven to ten years and that some of that data can then be moved off to an Azure SQL database for storage off-site and you don't have to incur storage costs of trying to keep it all on your local SQL server. Of course we're going to make sure that your link to Azure is nice and quick so that when you execute a query um, against that data it executes in, time, in a timely manner that kind of stuff. There's a lot of um, restrictions and, and, and things to think about when you go and work with the Stretch database. There, it, it's a really, really cool feature. It's one of those niche, niche features that if you need it, then you're definitely interested in it. You're going to investigate that and figure out exactly how to utilize that in your environment. Um, for people that um, don't specifically need that, then uh, maybe it's, it's something that you don't think is worth it for you, but uh, it is definitely a cool feature. I know that somebody is doing a webinar on this, on this whole thing and doing demos and the whole thing later this month, so definitely check that out. Um, I know there was a question about stretch databases. Backup and restore, what happens with the backup is it backs up the local data when you execute the backup, and that is currently in, uh, well, from what I knew before the RTM came out, there, there wasn't much information available, so I'm going to have to go and check on exactly what the backup and restore scenario is now with the RTM stretch databases. Can I use stretch databases to archive to other on-premises instances? No, it only use, goes to Azure SQL database. Um, there's a bunch of questions on backups. Like I say, I will go and investigate exactly what the scenario is with the backups currently when the, in the new release of SQL 2016, and I'm sure that that uh, question is going to be answered in our webinar later this month as well, so I'll get back to you guys on that. Is the data that's transferred from on-premises to Azure encrypted when using Stretch Database? Definitely. The data transfer that is happening between uh, on-premises and Azure is encrypted as with all connections to Azure. They're all encrypted and all the transfers are always encrypted. There are some limitations with Stretch Databases, uh, feature limitations, things like uh, file stream data, change data capture, um, various data types, check default and foreign key restraints, that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, they 
released this in CTP3. There have been a few versions since then. I have not been able to keep up because they bring up these things so quickly. So there is a limitations link to what the current limitations are for Stretch Database, and there's the link right there. Um, and like I say, we will update you as to what the current status of Stretch Database is um, later this month in our future webinar. So keep looking for that. Always on. Always on has been enhanced a little bit in SQL 2016. It was a really cool feature that was introduced in SQL 2012. The always on availability groups basically replaced database mirroring and you could also include things like uh, a listener for being able to connect to the primary and the secondary when it fails over without changing your um, access points and your connection strings. There were some limitations and that sort of thing, but they've been evolving all the way along. The new stuff that's been introduced with SQL 2016 are things like additional synchronous failover targets. Previously, you could only have one synchronous failover target. Now you can have up to three synchronous failover targets, replicas. You um, now get DTC support in always on availability groups. You can now configure load balancing for readable secondaries. So when SQL 2014, you could only have one readable secondary to a single primary. But now you can configure load balancing for readable secondaries. You can um, use group managed service accounts, that sort of thing. SQL 2016 also improves a lot of the performance of always on availability groups by improving the log transport and all that sort of thing. So they are making a lot of movements um, in the right direction with always on. Really, really cool feature and I'm really excited to see them enhancing it so that it's not just left out in the cold. Um, question here on always on. What is in standard versus enterprise? Standard is still going to be your basic always on availability groups. You're going to get a maximum, I believe, of four replicas total and you're only going to have one uh, readable, um, I mean, one synchronous failover target and uh, you're not going to be able to use load balancing for readable secondaries. That kind of stuff is going to only be available in enterprise edition. So standard. Uh, kind of stays the same, but these new features, these new enhancements are added into the uh, enterprise version. Polybase. Polybase is a really, really cool feature, very close and near and dear to my heart because I've been working with Polybase for three years now. I've been um, configuring and working with PDWs since they came out in 2013, when they upgraded the PDW to the APS, um, they introduced Polybase, they introduced the Hadoop region in the PDW and created the APS, the Analytics Platform System, and I've been working with Polybase since then. I've done a bunch of really cool uh, projects with some really cool companies to actually utilize Polybase in the PDW environment, in the APS environment. Now they're in introducing Polybase directly into SQL Server so that you can use your SQL Server to access Hadoop clusters directly in SQL Server. The way that that works is that you create a uh, external data source and file format. You define that in your SQL Server and then you create what's known as an external table. The external table is basically a reference table in SQL Server that references that Hadoop data in your Hadoop cluster. When you query that external table in SQL, the MapReduce job then is generated on the Hadoop cluster to go and return that data from the HDFS. So SQL is actually, this Polybase is using a scoop-based connector to connect to Hadoop and generate a MapReduce job to go and query the data that's in the HDFS in Hadoop. What's really cool 
with Polybase in SQL Server is that you can not only query that data, you can import that data into SQL Server. And the only thing, or this is the thing that SQL Server has um, going for it in better than everybody else, all the other relational database management systems in, the, in existence, is that you can actually take SQL data and then go and place it in Hadoop using Polybase as well. So it's a two-way street. It's really, really awesome that you can query the data from Hadoop directly in SQL using T-SQL language. And that is the one of the main things is that the users in your environment don't have to learn uh, MapReduce and Pig and Hive and all of these weird and wonderful stuff. They can use their bug T-SQL to go and query their data and you can use this Hadoop file system to store unstructured data that they have access to. So it's a really, really cool way of connecting to unstructured data and to flat files and that sort of thing in your Hadoop cluster. I know that there is a um, webinar coming up, I think it's next week, on Polybase. So definitely, if you're interested in that, go check that out. It's going to be really cool stuff. Um, I don't see any questions for on Polybase. So we move on to JSON support. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It is um, used primarily as an alternative to XML between web applications and servers. So JSON is one of the highest ranked requests by customers to be included in SQL Server. So uh, SQL has been working. The, our product team has been working to improve JSON support in SQL Server from the first CTP that they released, where they just had four JSON. Now they have um, Open JSON, Is JSON, all these things. They've included full JSON support in SQL Server 2016. Um, it is used uh, my, in the majority of web APIs. Um, it's used for mobile apps. All sorts of things use JSON to. Uh, transmit the data between a server and an application and now that is included, the support is included in SQL Server 2016. Uh, definitely go and have a look at the JSON support page and I have a link later in the references section um, to go and have a look at that in SQL Server 2016 so that you can see exactly what is supported and what's not supported and what the uh, technology is what the feature looks like currently. Attempt to be enhancements. Microsoft made some really, really cool enhancements in around in and around TempTB. You don't need to use trace flags 1117 and 1118 anymore because they've changed the way that page allocation and uh, the data allocation works between multiple files. When you set up SQL Server, you can configure multiple uh, TempDB files during the initial setup. And this is huge because I can't tell you how many times I go to my customers and they have this humongous server with you know, 16 core CPUs and they have a single TempDB file um, because it's not an option to configure multiple TempDB files in the initial setup. So when you go click next, 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 go, it doesn't configure multiple TempDB files yet. SQL Server 2016 improves on that. There is a limitation though that your default initial size is 8 meg and the order growth is 64 meg and the maximum that you can configure is 256 meg I believe, but it's a start. It's a definitely a good start so that you can go and configure multiple TempDB files during initial setup. What's also really cool is that you can configure multiple volumes for TempDB files as well during initial setup so that you can have your TempDB files spread over multiple volumes, gives you more performance, reduces contention, all of that good stuff. Do we have any more questions? When you do an upgrade you know, I haven't attempted an upgrade um, to SQL 2016 yet, so I 
do not know if it changes the number of files in SQL TempDB. Uh, I will have to go check that and I'll get back to you on that definitely. Um, I have another question on JSON. Do we need to serialize the JSON file or do we have T-SQL to use the JSON? Um, I do not have an answer for that because I'm not sure how that works. When you are using JSON, I believe that it's similar to the way you utilize XML um, in T-SQL, but I know that there are blog posts and uh, information out there on how the JSON actually works with that feature, so go and check that out, and I will also work on an answer for that for you. I have a lot of references yeah, in the slides. Um, the main product page has been updated since they released SQL Server 2016 yesterday. There's a link to the Always Encrypted page. Um, Tim Radney, my good buddy who's a fellow regional mentor in the Southeast, has an introduction to Stretch Database article. Um, I know that we're going to be doing a webinar on it later this month talking about webinars. What you should go and check is our blog on all about SQL Server 2016 on Pragmatic Works on blog.pragmaticworks.com where you can get a list of all the actual 2016 webinars that we're going to be doing. Um, query Store, there's references to the um, Query Store and Channel 9 is a really, really good uh, video on how Query Store in SQL Server works. Row level security, stretch database, polybase. Um, Aaron Bertrand has a great article on advanced JSON techniques in SQL 2016. And our German friend Klaus has an article on TempDB changes in SQL 2016. One thing I also wanted to point out is that Microsoft has released a the samples for SQL 2016. Um, they haven't released it on their CodePlex page yet, but you can go and download it from GitHub. If you go to this uh, directory here, and we'll uh, make sure to put this, let's copy this into the chat. This link here has a link to the SQL Server samples. You have to drill down a little bit here. You go to samples databases, worldwide importers. Worldwide importers is now the new sample database for SQL Server 2016 and Azure SQL database. If you go to this page here, worldwide importers, there is um, a link to be able to down download the sample scripts. There is actually uh, an ETL, an SSIS ETL package that you can download that will go and ETL the transactional database into the analytics database. You can also go here to documentation and to the root page and you go and download the source code and the released version of Worldwide Importers. So Worldwide Importers is now taking over from AdventureWorks and it is the new samples for SQL Server 2016 and Azure SQL Database. There is um, an installation and configuration page. There is an overview page that tells you exactly what worldwide importers are. Um, there's the data warehouse for worldwide importers. There's also the data generation and uh, sample queries and all sorts of really cool stuff. So definitely go check that out. If you're going to be playing with SQL Server 2016, you're going to need a set of databases to go and play with. Um, the best part about this is that the features that have been included in this database are all the cool features that we've been talking about. They include um, AJAX calls for JSON, temporal tables, they include row-level security, um, in-memory LTP, tables, clustered columns or index tables, always encrypted, um, stretch database stuff, full text indexes, um, query store is enabled on the database, auditing features included, 
in the sample database, all of that good stuff. So you can go and play with all the cool new features in 2016 by downloading this new worldwide importers database. And if you want to go and download SQL Server 2016 and you don't have an MSDN subscription, which a lot of people don't, like me, I don't have an MSDN subscription as such, but you can go and register for a what's known as Visual Studio Dev Developer Essentials. You can go and register for a free account. You go to just type in Visual Studio Developer Essentials in Google, or Bing, preferably Bing, and it'll bring you to your Visual Studio Developer Essentials account. When you set up a free account and you click on your benefits, you come to this page here which shows you some cool benefits that you get with Visual Studio Developer Essentials. You can get all sorts of Visual Studio code and all sorts of things. You get $25 a month to play with Azure. Really, really cool stuff for your own personal sandbox. You get three months access to Pluralsight. Most, most importantly, what I want to show you today is that you can download right here for free Microsoft SQL Server 2016 Developer Edition. You click on the Developer Edition download link and here you have SQL Server 2016 Developer Edition for free for you to go and play with. Remember, please do not use this as production. This is SQL 2016 Developer Edition. So there you have it. Now you can go and download SQL Server 2016 Developer Edition. You can go and download the sample database, Worldwide Importers, and you can start playing with it and using it. And throughout the month, we're going to have webinars on all the new features so you can follow along and get used to SQL 2016. Thank you very much, guys. That's it. Um, yep. I hope that I gave you guys a little bit of an insight into the cool new stuff that's coming out in SQL 2016 and the rest of the month we're really going to deep dive into each of these features individually and uh, have a good time figuring out exactly how SQL is going to work in your environment. Yep. I'm done? Yes. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, everybody. Um, like Gareth said, our whole uh, webinars this month are dedicated to SQL 2016, so be sure to check those out on our website. Um, as always, you'll receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording, so please feel free to pass that on and share that. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me, Liz, and I'll pass on any questions to Gareth. My email is what comes with all your go-to webinar information. Um, Gareth's contact information is still up on the screen. Um, now it's not, <laughs> so if you missed Was, it, sorry. that's okay, but if you missed it, I will pass on any questions. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gareth. Thank you very much. Okay, have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.